Okay. If I could just get your first and last name so I have it on tape and the correct spelling of it. Yeah. My name is Jimmy Kanaya, spelled J-I-M-M-I-E. Last name is K-A-N-A-Y-A. And what, um, when you retired, you were, you rank? Oh, the colonel, yeah. And so you went in as an enlisted man, or? Yeah, private minus E1. <laughs> $21 a day, once a month. <laughs> Big pay, big yeah. dollars. Yeah, once a month, yeah. Where did you, I'll start a little bit before we get in the service, and then we'll, we'll get in that. Wait, now, you grew up where? In uh, Clarkmas, Oregon. Uh, just outside of Portland, and uh, the family moved into town uh, oh, uh, when I was about uh, 12 years old. So it would be 19, well, 32 or thereabouts. Mm -hmm. And so you're Nisei. Mm -hmm. your second, father, yeah, second generation. Mm -hmm. And your father was Issei. Mm -hmm. How, do you know uh, um, why your father ended up in Oregon? Or Well, uh, as far as I know, he came over as a, uh, uh, a railroad worker when the Chinese were through with their indentured portion of the uh, imported uh, servitude, you might say, at the railroad, why well, they left and uh, they brought the Japanese in from Japan and also uh, some Filipinos too, as I, as I understand. And then when this period was up, uh, he must have been about, oh, 18, 19, 20, uh, he started the farming and then he went back uh, uh, to Japan and married a mother and brought her back here and to the farm and uh, uh, settled in Clackamas, Oregon. They had a 40-acre farm there, truck gardening. And, uh, and then about 1933, we moved into town. So gave up farming? Yeah, gave up farming. It's Because a lot of kids probably won't understand truck farming. Truck farming, you did a variety of vegetables and... Everything, uh, chickens and rabbits and the pigeons and the, uh, fruits, vegetables, everything that uh, grows. It eats, <laughs> but no, uh, no cattle, no cows. We didn't have any cows, but horses. Yeah. And then your father would be responsible for taking those to market. He would take the early market uh, every morning, about five, well, it's five or six days a week, uh, from Clackamas to downtown uh, to Portland. Early market was about uh, oh, about ten miles, and he'd go by a wa uh, horse and wagon, about three or four o'clock in the morning, and. He'd be through by uh, 8 or 9, 10 o'clock, and he'd be back by uh, early afternoon, and uh, he'd take a nap, and then he'd go back to the field and work till it got dark. And when I got, came up from school, guess what my job was? <laughs> we had no time for little league baseball or football, <laughs> no soccer. <laughs> How big a family? How many brothers? I had one older sister and one younger brother. It's, uh, what, what was your mom like? Well, she was a farmer's housewife, yeah. She worked on a farm and uh, helped my dad and then came home and cooked and uh, I guess tried to take care of the kids, uh, uh, cook and uh, we, we had, during the Depression years, you know, 30s, uh, early 40s, uh, we were always had plenty of food to eat. We didn't have meat, you know, but we had rabbits and chickens and we had uh, uh, all the vegetables you want to eat all year long. I don't ever recall going hungry. Yeah. It's interesting because in hindsight, when you read about the Depression and everybody thinks everybody was starving and everybody was in, but yet being in the midst of it, did you even realize that you were in a Depression as a kid? We had, uh, of course, you know, the people in Japan grew up that way. They're very frugal, uh, no luxuries, and they're used to cold water, you know, and uh, uh, a cold room and uh, eating uh, half-cooked uh, food, uh, but they ate a lot of rice, you know. <laughs> no bread, but potatoes, a lot of rice. We had all the vegetables that we wanted to eat, just about all year long. I don't know how they did it. In the wintertime, the vegetables don't grow, you know, but how How did, uh, they must have canned it, I think, canned vegetables and uh, made it last. And we had, I recall we had a, a cellar that had big mounds of potatoes in the cellar and carrots. And uh, how they kept them from freezing, I don't know. My dad would take out 10 or 12 boxes and take them to the market, you know, every morning. Was Japanese spoken in the house or English? Well, Japanese was spoken in the house until we started going to uh, uh, school, and then we had to learn English. 
I was there about five or six years old, and he got to learn English, and that was quite an experience. And we come home, and we speak Japanese. And to me, that was one of the, uh, I, to think about it, it was a problem. Because as we grew up, I could not communicate with my parents, except for, you know, daily food and water and drink and work and play and uh, uh, nothing that has to do with English or grammar or history or, you know, we had to learn that in school. And that uh, was a, a kind of a separation there. And our parents, you know, being over here in America, they did not know what's going on in Japan because Japan was progressing. So our parents' language in the States was different from a, their parents' language in Japan, you know. There was a kind of a gap there. And to me, that was a kind of a conflict because I couldn't get any help from my schoolwork, you know, from my parents. They would give me a, I recall one day, I think one of the teachers came and chewed my father out because I was failing at reading. So he plopped me down on the table one night and he couldn't read that well, you know, so he says, now read this. <laughs> So I kind of mumbled my way around it. <laughs> well, I just about failed uh, you know, all my grades. In high school, I, uh, I had a hard time in high school. Because so, I only finished three years of high school. Did your, did your dad speak both Japanese and English, or mostly Japanese? Mostly Japanese. He and my mother both ran a store, you know. So they had to learn enough about the store, the dollars and cents and cabbies and letters and crates and a dozen of this or six of that. They had to, they had to learn the, uh, the, just enough English to, to get by with their uh, work. They, they had a fruit stand uh, in Portland. When they went to the early market, uh, they had a fruit stand uh, on the Amhill Street before uh, they, the Amhill Street uh, fruit stand was all eliminated and they had to buy their own little, or rent their own stall uh, in that same area, in a, in, a, in a big building. And do you know Fred Myers? Fred Myers had their first store by half a block from my father's store around the corner. And he was selling, Fred Myers was selling vegetables and, and groceries and he branched out into meat market and, then, and prescription drugs and then he had, <laughs> look at him now. <laughs> did, did your dad have a name for his stand? Yeah, or? he called it MK Fruit, uh, MK Fruit. But it was actually more vegetables than fruit, though. <laughs> <coughs> huh. So growing up, did you, it, it's interesting because, um, like you started to talk about the separation, Japan was changing since your dad had left. Did your dad view himself as Japanese? Or American, or do you know? What, what what was the question now? Did, did your dad view himself as Japanese or American? Well, he had to uh, he had to be be both because his livelihood depended upon American. The Japanese, uh, as a community, you know, was kind of semi organized. You know, they had a a Japanese uh, kind of a chamber of commerce group. You know, and he had to get along with them. Uh, so he had to play both ends, as I can uh, perceive it at this point. I think he uh, uh, he he wasn't very uh, my my dad wasn't very bo vocal. He kind of let things roll with the punches, you know. And he uh, uh, he was pretty strict, kind of a no nonsense uh, kind of a guy, you know. So uh, he uh, he didn't say much because, as I said, though, it's pretty hard to communicate. When he, he got mad at me, if he ever got mad at me in Japanese, I, I, you know, it didn't bother me because, you know, it was not in English. <laughs> so, so what did you view yourself as growing up, Japanese or American? Or did you even think well, about that? Well, in a country, I think I was the only, uh, only boy in my grammar school who was, uh, uh, who was Japanese, American. They had a couple of two other families, but they were all girls, and uh, the boy was still not in school. So I was the only Japanese American boy in the whole school. And so my, all my friends were, you know, were, were Italians mostly in the neighborhood and, uh, and Caucasians. Uh, 
And when I moved into town, again, we moved into an Italian neighborhood. So I have more Italian friends than Japanese friends. Yeah. And I, I learned a lot of Italian slang words. And <laughs> so when I went to Italy during the war, well, I was a little bit ahead of the rest of the group. <laughs> yeah, a lot of my closest friends are Italian Americans. Yeah. Yeah. Was, was that an issue then? The, 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 the different nationalities or were you just all kind of people and it wasn't that big a deal? Well, to me it didn't bother me uh, because if you grow up, see, I didn't grow up in a Japanese neighborhood like so many other people did, Japan American neighborhood, and so my uh, contacts were, uh, were uh, mostly a little bit of both. I couldn't get away with the fact that, you know, uh, I'm, not, I'm not white and I'm not Italian, uh, uh, so uh, but I had to get along with both sides. I joined the judo club in Portland, so it was all mostly all Japanese Niseis, you know. I went to a Japanese uh, church that taught English in the evening called the Epworth League, a Methodist group, and so that was about the extent of it, once a week. Judo once a week and uh, church once a week. That was about the only contact I had uh, with the Japanese. Oh, in high school, our judo group at Benson Tech was a, you know, it's an all-boys school. Uh, they had a wrestling, and the wrestling team was, most of us in the judo group were wrestling at Benson. So we go, so, you know, we were the practice of the whole team, wrestling team. And uh, so that, we got together in high school at that end of it, you know. But the rest of the time was all, all Caucasians, yeah. Huh. Had you ever been to Japan uh before high school or in, as a kid, did well, you ever? When I was in first grade, my mother and father took my sister and brother to Japan for what, I don't know. And they left us there. Me and my brother stayed with his father's side and my sister stayed with the mother's side, which is about four or five miles away. And they came back. And, uh, and I went to school in Japan for about uh, six months, you know. I recall uh, being in first grade, I had no idea what I was doing, and just stumbling around. In about six or eight months, my mother came back, picked us up, brought us back to, to Clackamas, Oregon. You know, for, I think they had uh, visions of leaving us there to be educated in Japan, you know. But they, uh, my mother and father told us later that they couldn't stand, you know, being away from the kids, so they brought us back, and uh, that was about, what year was it, about 1925, 26? Yeah. What, what part of Japan? Well, Okayama, which is south of Tokyo, about, uh, oh, what, a couple hundred miles uh, south and west of Tokyo. And is that where your father and mother Yeah, were my from? father's, my father's father uh, was some kind of a landlord. He had, uh, he had acreage there, and he had tenant farmers all around this hill that uh, that he owned. And he owned a lake and a pond, and he he owned the whole area. So apparently, he was one of the samurai uh, uh, disciples, if you will, and he was awarded that territory from the from the shogunate that ran that area. And uh, so he must have been a pretty much of a big shot now. But after the war, they, MacArthur's decree was that all tenant farmers will get the land that they worked, and the and the landlord will only get what he needs to feed the family, which was just my father and grandmother. So when I was stationed in Japan in '48, we went down there to visit them, and my uncle, my grandfather, already gone, mother, and uh, and uh, one of the one of my uncles took over the homestead. Uh, he says, you know, he says, parceling out my land is like communism, he says. He says, that's communism. He says, how come <laughs> we Democrats are communists? <laughs> I had no answer. <laughs> but uh, my father was the oldest boy among ten kids. He had uh, five brothers and, and four sisters. So the, in the Japanese... Uh, system of uh, descendants taking over the, the uh, parents' assets, the oldest son 
that's supposed to take over. Well, my dad's been over here for all these years, and he didn't want to go back there. I recall him talking to my mother about, Lil, let, uh, let one of our brothers take over. So that's the brother. The, uh, he was the next to the youngest brother that took over the homestead. And all he had was that maybe, uh, maybe one acre of land when his uh, father had about 40 acres, you know. So he was kind of, he wasn't too happy. You know? <laughs> so the occupation of, uh, of Japan to him was, you know, kind of a downfall. You know? He wasn't a big shot like he should have been. <laughs> but still, you come from a very uh, honorable family uh, with a samurai uh, lineage in there. Well, do you know, they never mentioned it to me, you know. They never mentioned it to me. I thought when I got over there, I might find some souvenirs that they would give me, you know, of the samurai days. Nope, they didn't offer me anything. I said, oh, the hell with you. <laughs> <laughs> now, when did you, because um, you signed up to this in the service before the war started. Is that, when, when did you sign up and what branch? Well, I started uh, late 1940. Uh, a draft started in August. And I saw some of my friends being drafted, so I thought, geez, I better get it on the act now before the war's over. So um, uh, I started around late uh, 40, 1940, and it was April, it was April of 41 before I finally got in. So it takes a, you know, uh, they, were, they were dragging their feet. I guess they didn't want the uh, Japanese Americans in the regular army for some reason. But you know, when they offered me a, a position, they said, oh, we got. We got coast artillery in Hawaii. We got coast artillery in LA, and we got cavalry at Campo, uh, Southern California. I said, oh, I said, I don't care. Send me anywhere. I said, okay. <laughs> they sent me to Monterey. <laughs> it was kind of a cavalry post, you know. I got my uniform, and all of a sudden, I found myself with the Air Corps basic training at, Ham at uh, Hamilton Field, <laughs> and then all of a sudden. But halfway through basic training, they pulled me out and said, hey, you're a medic now. <laughs> so I wanted to be in the Air Corps, you know, because everybody was talking about Air Corps. We're just coming up, the Army Air Corps. They want to be a mechanic, you know, uh, engine mechanic. Oh, so I'm going to be an engine mechanic. Oh, so I, me too. I want to go with that too. And so I was taking the basic training with all these guys, and all of a sudden they pulled me out and said, hey, you're a medic. <laughs> so they, they decided that you yeah. become a medic. That wasn't your first. No, it wasn't my, I had no idea. I had no medical training. Why would they take me as a medic? <laughs> Where were you when Pearl Harbor happened? I was at Santa Barbara at the Hoff General Hospital, a brand new hospital. And uh, they seemed to have, the medical department seemed to take Japanese because they didn't want them in the infantry or any other combat arms if they could help it. You know? So anybody who had an aptitude, why they took them in the medics. And uh, out of about 250 of us, there must have been um, 24 or 25 of us, Niseis, you know. Uh, there was about six Kibe, uh, Japanese uh, Americans educated in Japan, they came back here, they're called Kibe. And the rest of us are Niseis. And we were about uh, almost 10% of the whole medical detachment. You know? And we were placed in uh, different ward duty, you know, just playing the war duty, nothing, nothing specialized, you know, just pushing carts around and working a mess hall, and closing and opening doors. <laughs> so do you remember how you heard about Pearl Harbor and where you, what? It was on a Sunday, and every Sunday morning, I would go to the YMCA real early in the morning when they first opened up at, at Santa Barbara, because there was nobody there, and uh, we had the swim in the buff, you know, we couldn't wear any suit. And the, and the, uh, the water was highly chlorinated that, you know, every week. And nobody wanted to swim that day, so, on Sunday. So I just always go there and swim by myself. And I came out, uh, it must have been about, what, uh, 10 o'clock? Yeah, three hours after. And there was a tall Caucasian man standing at the desk, you know, where the uh, caretaker was. He, he looked at me and says, you guys here already? You know? I said, what? He said, listen. And they, they had a radio on a windowsill, and this guy was at the desk was listening to the 
bombing of Pearl Harbor. I says, what the hell? What's going on? Boy, I tell you, I, I hightailed back to the hospital, which is about three or four miles away. And do you know, from that point on, uh, things are kind of blank, you know, kind of a blur. I just sort of roll with the punches, so to speak. I, uh, I, uh, my mind was completely uh, oblivious of what was going on around me, you know. I just kind of did my job and I got promoted, you know. I kept getting promoted. Uh, in about six months, uh, I was a PFC, but I was making more money than a buck sergeant was making, a three striper. <laughs> so what they did was they uh, they busted me back to a corporal, you know, from a PF. Of a, I had a specialist rating, uh, and they they uh, promoted me to a corporal because I was making more money than a sergeant was. <laughs> I, mean, I lost seven dollars a month by getting promoted. <laughs> Did the attitude change? Because here you are with this the the, the medic, medical corps, and you said that it was a majority of uh, Nisei and and uh, Kisei. Was there any discrimination against you, or did everybody look and say you're in uniform? And well, uh, I didn't. We didn't notice it too much because in the medical department we're pretty tolerant. You know, people made friends. Uh, regardless, and the doctors and nurses, uh, they were very uh, uh, understanding of our situation. They helped us, you know, and uh, if they wanted to, they could have uh, busted us. A lot of, most of us are PFCs, and I was the only corporal. They could have, we don't want you, you know, get the hell out of here. They could have done that, but they didn't. So nobody felt you were a spy or anything like that? No, Did... but, you know, you know, we... Called each other spies. You know? <laughs> You're a Zap spy. You know, we're just joking you know, among ourselves. <laughs> but uh, uh, you know, you know, we kind of. Uh, uh, you can't. Uh, some of the guys might take objections. You know, and it didn't bother me at all if they felt that way. If they want to make friends with me, they didn't have to. You know, I could. Uh, I had a boss. And I was working. I had a job. Uh, three meals a day, and so you know, I didn't care. But uh, do you know? After about, uh, let's see, December, January, February, March, about, after about three months, we were all called in together, you know, about 25 of us. And you know the commanding officer, uh, tall, gentleman-looking, gray-haired, commanding doctor, he came down and, and he thanked us, you know, for helping us, and he felt sorry we had to leave the command and we were going to be missed, you know. He really thought, felt badly about us leaving. You know, he didn't have to do that. He could have said, eh, get the hell out of here, you know. But uh, he, he was, he knew what, you know, what the problem was and how we felt. And I thought that was quite, a, quite an act on his part, you know. And he, uh, so I, I kind of respect the medical department for, you know, for taking care of us and, you know, and, and uh, putting up with me especially, you know. <laughs> Now, what was happening back home? Because uh, Stillwater came down with his orders. Did that affect your your parents back home with the the incarceration, the the, the internment? Uh, who, Stillwater. Well, yeah, it's it, um, the order that that oh, originally was going to be. Say. What's that? The evacuation order. Oh, the, the evacuation. The, yeah. Did that affect your family back home? Oh yeah, yep. They had to sell out whatever they had. Of course, my father was lucky. He didn't own the, the the shop that he was working with, you know, so he just sold everything out, and and I I came back uh, from uh, Camp Shelby to help him move, you know, and he had a car. He paid nine hundred dollars for it, uh, oh, about six months before, you know, and all he could get was four hundred fifty dollars for it, you know. Yeah, well, of course, I was in uniform, so we went to a couple of dealers uh, to. And the the best offer was four fifty. You know, it was worth about you know, seven eight hundred dollars. But but then no, that's all he got. You know, what are they gonna do? And then you know, a day of evacuation, I helped them move. You know, from uh, their home to the assembly center, which is the Portland Stockyard. You know, along the Columbia River there, just on the side of the bridge. And uh, I was helping my parents moving into the 
to the cell, and I started to walk back into where they were going to be installed, you know. And next thing I know, I tap on our shoulder, there's a big Lieutenant Colonel MP. He says, come with me, Corporal. <laughs> so, and he took me into his office, he says, you don't belong here. I said, well, so I got my furlough papers, I got three more days, you know. But then he knew that I shouldn't be there with my parents and all the other people being evacuated, you know? He says, I want you to go to go to town, get on the first train or bus out of Portland. Go back to your base, he says. Yes, I still had three days to go. I said, okay. I think he gave me a sedan, by the way. Took me to the USO. And he wanted to be called as soon as I made reservations by the bus or train. And if I recall correctly, uh, the bus depot was about three or four blocks from the USO, so I said, I got a schedule, so I'll be, I'll be out of here at 2.30, sir. So, okay, bang. <laughs> yeah, so I had to go back to camp. I think I had about two or three more days, so I stopped off for a couple of days in Kansas City and then checked back in. So he didn't feel you should be with your parents because you were in uniform? Yeah. or No, uh, no, no Japanese, no they say soldier was supposed to be on the West Coast. They were all out of there. Yeah. I recall when we left camp, uh, when we left Santa Barbara, two of our NCO cockies and NCO friends, you know, were security guards and they kept the, uh, they kept the 45, you know, uh, uh, and uh, we were always put on the last car in this train leaving the West Coast to go to wherever. Uh, and all the shades were down. But after about a day and a half of, you know, we knew they, they were all friends of ours, you know. They took the pistol, put it away, and they started playing cards with us. And we were the last car because they didn't want anybody walking through our car, see. And I recall one of the sergeants, you know, guard, he's an older guy. He would bring visitors a peek into our windows and they look at us like we were some some animals caged, in. <laughs> and, and he would say, "Oh, you know, you could hear me, you know, tell what's going on." And uh, people were curious, you know. Finally, I ended up at uh, Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, and, and from there, a bunch of us went to Camp Carter, Missouri, to the hospital there. Is that when you? We're now attached to the 442nd? So that's, you know, that's when we left, uh, uh, when the 442nd was activated, we went, uh, the medical detachment cadre was formed out of our, our medical people at uh, Camp Crowder, Missouri. And uh, there was about uh, nine of us. And I, I was promoted from a, cor uh, from a sergeant uh, to tech sergeant as an acting first sergeant for that medical detachment. Now, where did your, well, I guess two questions. I'll ask the one first. When you went and saw your parents, and was it your sister? My brother and sister, yeah, and mother and father. What was their mood? I mean, this had to be devastating. I didn't say, oh, I didn't say much at all. Oh, they, uh, you have to be pretty passive, you know, because uh, orders are orders. They had soldiers with bayonets, you know, standing guard, and uh, uh, what can they do, Yeah. Where did they then go from? Because that was just the the staging area, correct? And yeah. So where which camp did they? They get? went to Minidoka. They went to the uh, camp where the most of the people from Oregon and uh, Washington were sent to Minidoka, uh, Idaho, and uh, I went to visit them a couple of times, you know, in camp. And do you know? Uh, looking back, I says, here I am. I had I was a, I was the first sergeant. And there was an MP guard at the gate at this camp in Idaho, and I had to ask his permission to go in to visit my parents, and they had to meet me at the at the reception area, you know. And they were like to do in prison, you know, you go to prison where you have to you have a holding area where you can't go straight to the gate to the you know to where they're living, you know. So they had to meet me. Then they had to escort me to the living quarters. Another funny thing, you know. Uh, Looking back on it, when I went to the camp to visit my, visit my parents, none of my old friends that I knew in Portland would come to visit me. You know, 
I don't know why, I just, uh, whether the fact that I was in the army, maybe uh, if they came to visit me with me, well, they would think that they were traitors or something. I don't know. Uh, uh, or maybe they were too busy. Uh, yeah, I just, uh, I didn't think much about it at the time, you know, but now I said, how come my buddies didn't come around, people that I knew? They were, you know, the, even my brother, you know, I don't think he came around to, <laughs> he was, I guess he was too busy. He was a teenager, you know, running around with his own buddies, I guess. <laughs> It's interesting because the camps have been called by a lot of different names, um, internment camp, uh, a variety of names, and concentration camp. And we had a general, and that's in the tape. One of the Japanese American citizen refers to it as a concentration camp, which is a name I don't have a problem with because that's what they were. But I got this email from a person who had reviewed the tape and I'm not positive, but for some reason, just in the writing of it, uh, I felt that the gentleman writing was Jewish, and he said, that's incorrect. They weren't concentration camps, or they're not the true concentration camps, but they were, weren't they? I mean, it was a prisoner camp. Well, it's a, like a stockade, army stockade. They had the guard posts, you know, and the security uh, on the towers. They had rifles, machine guns, and they had all the... Uh, Trappings of, uh, you know, where people are concentrated, you know, but they had the old school, you know, and they kept the old Boy Scout troops and the Girl Scouts, and they had their social groups, but uh, uh, in that sense, uh, you can't compare that to what we know happened in Germany with the, with the Jewish uh, uh, population, because uh, uh, the treatment was different, you know. More humane, you might say. More humane, concentrated treatment, if, if you will. It's a, uh, and, and I can understand that. It's not a concentration camp, but in a sense, even our President Roosevelt called it a concentration camp. So, you know, uh, what are you going to do? <laughs> it's, it's actually, they called it a relocation center run by the uh, War Relocation Authority, WRA. And, uh, you know, when you're relocated, you're relocated. Whether you have Bob wires around it, you can't leave, uh, uh, you're relocated. Because even though they were humane, to look at what happened to American citizens by the American government, it, 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 yes, they were treated nicely and there were schools and things like that, but yet your father had to give up his business, had to sell his car to us, and, and what, what about when he came out of the concentration camp? What did your father do after that? Well, he went to Chicago with mother. They had a job lined up uh, as a uh, kind of a caretaker uh, helper at a girl's dormitory in uh, Chicago, north side. So uh, they ended up there. Then they uh, took over a hotel business right on Clark Street. I don't know if you know Chicago, the, Clark, the infamous Clark Street. And they had that for about 10 years. And then they went out, they uh, bought another apartment house, uh, uh, sold that, bought an apartment house. And they sold the apartment and they moved into a duplex, a triplex, and uh, uh, that's where they ended up. Uh, but uh, they, uh, and one thing I realized, my father was completely, uh, I would say uh, not dejected. Uh, he he had no ambition. He lost all authority. You know, he was not the head of the household anymore. He he didn't have anything to say about the food we're eating. You know, or clothes we're getting. And uh, and after he was evacuated, he never drove a car again. You know, afterwards he never bought a car. He never drove. And. Uh, uh, that's kind of strange, you know. Of course, a lot of them, they were uh, 55, 60 years old by that time, so I guess they figured, what the heck, you know, cars are hard to get anyway, and they weren't making any money, and they couldn't afford a car. If they had one, if they could afford one, but maybe that's the reason, I don't know. But they made it all right, yeah. They, uh, they had, my brother came into service too, uh, from a camp. Oh, well, one thing about the camp, you know, they, uh, you know, our parents could not become citizens. You know, they were prohibited 
from naturalization, so they were still considered aliens. But the kids born and raised here, they were 1A, draft eligible, and then all of a sudden, they had to be evacuated with the parents. They couldn't leave them on the West Coast or, or leave the, the... So they had to be evacuated with their parents. They were called non-aliens. They weren't citizens, but they were non-aliens. And they were 1A, draft eligible, and all of a sudden they declared 4C, enemy alien, unfit for, for military duty. Then all of a sudden, when our regiment was formed, we had to have a lot of filler personnel. Most of them came from Hawaii, but we had to have them from our camps too. So all, all of a sudden, they reclassified 1A again. Now, can you imagine that? <laughs> like I say, those kids were second ahead. <laughs> and a lot of them, most of them were very reluctant. But all of a sudden, they got the feeling and they started to, you know, they, uh, see, I was already in the service and my, uh, uh, I was sending things home, you know, to my parents. Uh, I gave my brother t shirts, you know, army t shirts. And so he felt that it was his duty to, to join, you know. And, and uh, over a thousand, I think, uh, people from the Northwest, and uh, about uh, six, seven hundred, I'm sure, came from a camp, you know. And so there was a, a big group of uh, uh, people. Once they got the feeling, you know, they build up. That's where uh, Mr. Doy had a recording of Paul Harvey yesterday who went through all the statistics of, of that when they asked for the volunteers and they thought they would get, and I forget, they thought maybe they'd get 2,000 and they got over 10,000 volunteers. I mean, it was, and the average IQ was above all the other troops. Uh, and so you had this very intelligent, dedicated, committed uh, regiment coming together. Which well, is interesting no. because you do look at the irony of it. You know, here they were, they were citizens, then they're, they're non-aliens. So that, <laughs> basically they said you're nobody because you're not an alien and you're not a so, citizen. So you're, you know, and now they come like you and, and dedicate to, to uh, serve their country. Do you know, uh, I don't know if ever, anybody ever brought this up, but uh, this is my old feeling. The... Uh, the regiment was formed with a cadre of those of us who were in the army before the war started from the United States, continental, not Hawaii, continental United States. We were on this age, born and raised 95% on the west coast. And uh, so we were NCOs, no, we were non-commissioned officers. And uh, I think the government, as I recall, in some uh, respects uh, the books ever written. The army wanted to test the loyalty of those of us born in the United States. So we formed the cadre, and then they expected the army expected most of the troops to come from these concentration camps, if you will, from the uh, relocation centers. But they were slow in coming. So the Hawaii group, like you said. Over 10,000 volunteered for 1,100 spaces. Only about one out of 10 were accepted. And they are the first ones to come in. And this is another complete story, you know. We had problems with them. And then, subsequently, when the groups started to volunteer, started coming in from these camps, uh, they, were, they were reclassified 1A, as I mentioned, uh, and then they. Um, uh, they were recruited, but they were they volunteered for the draft, so to speak. They were not enlisted. No, they were volunteered for the draft, so-called. You know, reluctant volunteers for the draft. <laughs> and these groups were young privates mixed in with Hawaiian privates. And the Hawaiis outnumbered us about four to one. And we were supposed to teach these, <laughs> these, I call, I call them recruits, but they were right out of the, the farm, you know, the plantation. And, uh, I don't want the Hawaiians to get teed off at me, but uh, they know. And they ruled, you know, they ruled, overruled us in many cases. 
And our NCOs were getting beat up by these Hawaiians after hours, you know. And we couldn't go crying to the officers, you know, officers are all Caucasian. They couldn't do anything. How can they stop some ethnic, you know, uh, differences? And so we had to put up with them. And it was a tough battle, I tell you. I got, I just I had ulcers, you know. <laughs> and these guys are wild, but they were good soldiers. Boy, they were tough, you know, and the uh, boxing team, we took over the boxing uh, tournaments, swimming. We, we took the Camp Shelby baseball tournaments. Uh, and I don't know about football, but uh, we had a good, uh, good troops as far as uh, lack of discipline is concerned. You know? You know, they know what had to be done, but they didn't want to take orders from us because we were, and they call us kotonks. You know? Ever hear that term before, kotonk? Mm -hmm. That's the sound of an empty beer ball hitting our head, no? yeah, <laughs> in a fight. <laughs> and, and, <empty. laughs> and I kind of, I, I didn't take real offense. You know, I laughed it off too because you know, I didn't get picked on that much. Uh, <coughs> some of them, my NCO's friends, you know, they got beat up at night. And, and that was the Hawaiian Japanese community with the uh, mainland Japanese yeah. community. And it was, it was, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't funny then, but to me, looking back on it now, I think it's kind of hilarious, you know, because uh, uh, when we got overseas, you know, all that difference, you know, was erased. We had one enemy, we had one goal, we had to fight the enemy, we had to win the war, go back and prove that we are, you know, uh, we had the right to live, you know, where we want to live and when we want to live. Because, you know, before the war, we couldn't eat certain restaurants. We go to a theater. We'd be sit way in the back. We can uh, we couldn't go to any public uh, uh, swimming pool except during certain hours. Kind of unwritten, you know, uh, uh, discrimination. It didn't uh, take long to realize that no, we shouldn't go to certain places. But then, you know, after the war, well, we felt that you no, know, we should deserve the right to go where we want to go, live who, live where we want to live. But those are the things that we fought for. And you know, before we went overseas, the Army was talking about breaking up the 442nd because we had too much conflict, internal conflict, though. And, they, and the Caucasian officers, uh, they, they were indifferent. They didn't care, you know. Uh, but can you imagine where we would be now if we were broken up, you know, and you know, spread out among all the Army doing a scut work, working yard detail, cleaning houses, you know. And, driving trucks, we would be nobody, you know. It's a good thing that we, uh, Army decided uh, with a better sense, you know, because after about, uh, what, 13 months after activation, we were in combat, huh? For the one regimental combat team, about, oh, 5,000, over 5,000 troops. Yeah, that's a quite a, you know, a cheap, uh, you know, it takes over, you know, a year and a half to two years to work up a group like that for combat. Huh? And some of them never make a combat. 442nd go for broke. It's a good thing that uh, the army had uh, better sets to keep us intact. We had we went on a last maneuver, a third army maneuver, and uh, we did all right. You know, we, for a regiment, uh, we fought against the division, you know, and we kind of went around them, you know, a couple of times. And uh, in fact, <laughs> our regiment. Uh, our third battalion in this maneuver captured uh, the enemy battalion command post. They were having a birthday party for their uh, one of the commander's staff, you know, and I'm entering maneuver. And so our troops, they figured they had rivers, so I couldn't, we couldn't cross the river. Why we, our troops waited across the river and they captured this battalion CP with battalion commander and all. Well. We go, we go overseas. Our third battalion commander was transferred to Washington D.C., and our EXO executive officer, Major O'Connor, took over. And uh, after about two weeks of, of combat, we got a new battalion commander. He was the battalion commander we captured in the maneuvers, <laughs> Colonel Al Purcell, <laughs> and he wanted to join our outfit. You know? <laughs> He was a good commander. A lot of troops didn't like him, but he was tough, you know. And uh, 
I have a lot of respect for him. Yeah, he he did a lot of things that he really didn't have to do, you know. And of course, he uh, uh, he was a real stickler for discipline, even in combat. You know, so uh, some of the troops uh, thought that he was a little too tough, but I didn't think so. He was right there in front of the troops. I stayed right with him, and I I knew exactly what was going on. Yeah. Now you were trained as a medic. Yeah. Uh -huh. So how extensive was your training? Well, uh, I didn't have any receive any any uh, formal training. It was just on the job. They put me in as a ward master in the officers' ward at this hospital in Santa Barbara, and uh, I had to take temperature, pulse, and respiration of all the officer patients. You know. I had to give them a bath if they couldn't bathe. I had to feed them if they couldn't feed themselves. Carry the bedpan, and the urinals, and change their sheets. And I had to learn all that. Uh, and this, I tell you, there was a nurse. She was a first lieutenant. She was a second ranking nurse in the hospital. She must have been 40 years old. A chief nurse was a captain. And I think she must have been about 55 years old. All the rest were second lieutenants, nurses. Anyway, she taught me how to do everything that I had to do, and she taught me once. And if I if I didn't learn the first time, it's too bad. <laughs> I I learned, and we had one uh, lady nurse patient that came in, and she had a room, and she taught me how to you know to take uh, pulse and respiration and. Uh, uh, how to change the bed, you know, roll on one side and then roll the other side over. <laughs> so no combat training at this point then? No, no combat training. I mean, training. that's great if you're going to be in a hospital or a medical facility, but not no combat training. in the middle of Europe somewhere. No. Did they give you any training before you were sent off to Europe? I mean, more extensive, or was that your... No, that, well, we didn't receive any combat training until we uh, got to Camp Shelby. And then, being medics, well, we had to train the, uh, the 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 aid man medics that we got from Hawaii and from these camps, and we had to give them basic training at the same time, basic training, and actually it was basic medical training, and we concentrated more on medical than than uh, basic training because doctors, you know, doctors aren't uh, soldiers back in those days. They, they were. They, all they want to do is wear a white coat and operate. That's all. <laughs> but here they were on the field, you know, and most of them were unhappy. <laughs> so guess who had to do all the training? You know, the NCOs. Yeah. You know, whereas the infantry is completely different. They had officers who were West Point, you know, ROTC, or uh, 90 Day Wonders, or whatever. And their NCOs had a mentor that they could go to for training, but we didn't. We had to take orders from doctors who didn't want any of the rifle training or marching or, if we go on a hike, no, the officers went with us, you know, but the infantry, the officers led. The NCOs followed the officers and the soldiers followed the NCOs. But here, you know, we had to, we had to lead the, the troops who, who also didn't want to Follow. <laughs> so you were a babysitter. Well, you know, it was kind of a double jeopardy, you know. <laughs> but, you know, we had to accept the fact that doctors are specialists and they are trained to do, you know, uh, their specialty training, highly trained, a lot of money invested in them, and we can't take a chance on getting them hurt, you know. So we had, we had to take care of them. We had one doctor who had some ROTC, and he gave us close order drill, and, uh, and we had to follow, you know, but that's about it, yeah. But now, did you wear the uh, Hollywood, and this is we're trying to de Hollywood fi World War II and make it to find out the real World War II? Hollywood always shows the medics with the red crosses and uh, red cross helmet and all that. Were you, if I looked out, could I pick out? Medics real easy? Did you wear the Red Cross? Well, most of the time you could, uh, depending on where we were. In Italy, the first uh, campaign in Italy, we wore the uh, Red Cross on a helmet in our front. I don't recall if we had it on the back or not. We wore the armband, one armband. And we carried the flag wherever we went. If we had to go 
to where they were fire, fighting while we had to, we waved the flag and uh, hoped that you know they wouldn't shoot us. But in some cases, when I had some medics uh, killed outright you know, with all this paraphernalia and uh, out in the open and nobody around, a sniper killed one of my uh, aid men and uh, he was a litter bearer. Uh, and that poor guy, you know, he's from Seattle. He had a PhD, uh, a professor at the University of Washington, joined the army uh, from camp as a private, and in about two, uh, 10 days in combat, he was dead. Oh, it's a shame. But he had an armband on, uh, the sniper just picked him out, I guess. Uh. So depending on where you are, if the Germans do not respect the Red Cross, we put mud over, you know, our helmets and uh, take the armband off, you know. Uh, but then if we are operating in an area where we had to be exposed, we tried to put the Red Cross out there so that they'll know that we're there. And if there's a lull in the fighting, why we go uh, out there to retrieve the, the wounded and the dead if necessary. And at the same time, you know, we also treated the German, wounded Germans, so they knew that, though, because we were always moving forward, and they would leave their wounded behind most of the time, you know, and they knew that they would be taken care of if they took care of us, you know, so it was kind of a give and take, yeah. Most of the time they did respect the Red Cross, but sometimes they wouldn't, yeah. And that's based on the Geneva Convention, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, you know, that's where there's a kind of a odd aspect of war in the fact that you have these two countries these soldiers that are killing each other back and forth but yet there's this humanistic aspect where as a red cross you take your flag you have your red cross and you walk out well i assume things are going on in front of you and behind you and around you but you're somewhat safe out there well yeah uh it all depends on how you're treated in other words, one incident, I know one of the medics were shot, and uh, uh, for a while there, it was unwritten, uh, not a rule, within that platoon or company, take no prisoners. You can't kill my medic, yeah. Take no prisoners. That goes on for a while, well, of, course, of course you can't prove it. And then, of course, you'll gradually wear off, you know. It all depends on the mood and, uh, and the situation. It's, uh, it happened more than once, you know. Yeah, it's, uh, it all depends on uh, uh, the, uh, if the enemy felt that they were being abused, you know. If we were bayoneting their wounded or something like that and they saw it, I'm sure they would be ruthless too. And we did the same thing. You know? and, uh, but it tapers off, and if you treat me right, I'll treat you right. Huh? In the meantime, they're shooting each other. <laughs> now, as a medic, you, you didn't carry a weapon, is that right? No, no weapon, yeah. So, what was your introduction to battle? When did you first, do you remember when you first had to go deal with a wounded soldier, and what was that like? You know, first day in combat, it's, it really, uh, well, it, you know, I had never really seen a dead body before in my life, except my uh, one of my cousins died as a young, a young baby or a girl, and uh, at a funeral I saw the body. That was about it. And I saw movies and pictures of you know, bodies of uh, guys who were eating sea ration, sitting on a near dead body, you know, and uh, all bloated up. I said, boys, I wonder how I'm going to feel. But you know. First day in combat, one of my uh, classmates in high school, he was the first sergeant in K Company, and uh, his company CP was in a, in a little valley, and there was a house and a well there, and company CP was was uh, right next to the well. And it was hot, it was, uh, it was in uh, June, uh, middle of uh, late June, and a lot of his troops went to the well to get water. He ran out to say, get away from it, you know, spread out. And sure enough, just about the time he said that, the 88 tank shot that well, and to kill about five or six of them. 
he goes, what of And we had to pick him up, you know, and, and evacuate him. And his company commander, first day in combat, he got shell-shocked. There goes his radio operator, his jeep driver, his first sergeant. His old company safety was gone. Huh? And I remember him, Captain Lazinski. He was very, uh, he looked like a typical West Pointer, you know. Nice looking, uh, six foot, 190 pound, uh, typical company commander. And here he was, he was at the aid station off to one side, and we didn't have him in the A station with a wounded, you know. He was just sitting there holding his head, you know, waiting for the ambulance to, to take him back. And I felt sorry for him, you know. But at the time, I felt, Jesus, uh, what's wrong with this guy, you know? How come? Typical officer, you know, a leader, company commander. And uh, so you can see what will happen if you, uh, uh, typical shell shock or war neurosis takes three or four weeks you know, to build up in months maybe and I had an aid man I had a couple of aid men uh, get that way you know they just get blank and they just they, they go out doing their job but without any enthusiasm you know so you gotta gotta get them out but people uh, I guess their tolerance for combat Depends on the individual, and uh, some people have have no tolerance you know, or very little tolerance, and some people are just wild. You, know, and, uh, <laughs> you might have heard of uh, 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 Cash Casino from Hawaii. I mean, from Seattle, he was kind of a wild man. He got silver stars and seven purple hearts, you know. And <laughs> so there are people at uh, all all levels in between, and they call them Cash. Casino, yeah, he called him Cash first. Yeah. I just saw a picture of him yesterday. Yeah, Jim, Jim. Uh, yeah, he's he's in one of the pictures here. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, did I understand right then? The first soldier that you saw that had been killed in the battlefield was a friend of yours from one of the first. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. what? Now, how old are you now? Twenty at this time. I thought. Oh no, I was uh, I was twenty three. Yeah. Twenty three. Mm -hmm. What? How did you? Because you said everybody deals with with war differently. How did you deal with that aspect? Well, I think the first uh, shock is what you have to get over. If you don't get over that, it'll, it'll build up. You know. By the second or third day, I saw German uh, soldiers that were dead left or lying as we went by. Uh, it was hot, and he must have been there at least one whole day because his his leather belt was tight around his stomach, it was all ballooned on both sides of the belt. And uh, the gas build up, you know. And so I walked by it and I didn't think anything of it. Went right across the street and, uh, and some of the guys were having a sea rasher, so I stopped there to eat with them, you know. There was bodies laying around and uh, of course we you know we, uh, theoretically, are not supposed to pick up any dead bodies. We could let the graves registration pick them up as they go through. You know, they come, they followed us, but we do like to collect them and put them in one spot, though, get them out of the way. And we don't like to have in the medic have uh, dead bodies mixed with alive wounded. You know, keep them separated and out of sight. So I got used to it. You know? Being a medic, you have to. You know, and I had soldiers die while I was carrying them. You know? They were alive when I picked them up, but then if they got a hole right through them, you, know, you, know, you can't plug up both ends and hope to <laughs> keep them alive, you know. So, uh, you get used to it, part of the job. Just like the infantry, I guess the part of the job is to kill the enemy, and part of our job is to save, uh, save lives, so it's a complete uh, contrast to our mission. You know? It's different. <laughs> How extensive was the medical services you could provide before getting them back to one of the doctors? What what would you do in the field? To well, I'm not a doctor, so I can't. I'm not a refined technician. We had pre med students and doctors back at the aid station did all the secondary work. You might say the first thing we do is split the broken bones if you can, stabilize the broken bones, stop the bleeding. That's it. That's all you can do. And then move them out. Sometimes we had to drag a guy with a broken leg, you know, and drag him for a hundred yards before we could splint him, you know. 
Can you imagine the pain? <laughs> and all we could do is provide morphine and injections to kill the pain. That was about all. Split the wound, stop the bleeding, and get him out of there. Yeah, that's all you can do. You can't do anything else. You can't stand up and give him IV, you know, and you can't, you can't stop them and try to resuscitate him, you know. You don't have time for that because there are other guys, you know. And it's a, it's a, uh, in the medical profession, we call that triage, but we, if there's three or four wounded and you're the only guy that will help, uh, the, you take the, the worst one first that's savable. If the guy is gulping blood and uh, he's, uh, you, know, and he, you can see he's not going to live, uh, you just, you can't, not, not a darn thing you can do about it, but take care of those that you might be able to save. And then get this guy out that's wounded badly and uh, move him out the uh, first chance you get. Uh, but uh, you have to establish priority. And, and these priorities sometimes are based on a private. A private has to make that decision. Those are the, what you call the company aid man. You know? They're started out as a private, and they can work themselves up to about a sergeant or, or staff sergeant level. And these are the guys that, uh, you know, they are the platoon doctors, you know, buck private. You know, and the, you know, back in peace time, in training, the medics are always called Names, you know, gold bricks, uh, pill pushers, uh, uh, what else, you know. But in combat, once they got into combat, the medic was always first in line to eat, you know, and uh, the infantry will not go anywhere without the medic behind them. You know, completely different atmosphere. But uh, in peacetime, you know, we always shoved off the side, hey, get out of my way. <laughs> pretty, pretty important on the battlefront. Oh, the battlefield, I tell you, we were kings. <laughs> Now, is there um, do would a medic would you wait until uh, the fighting moved past where the wounded were, or were you having to come out and deal with wounded while things were still active? We, both. We had to if our if our line was moving, there's no no problem. You know, they're moving, so the wounded would be left behind. And we'd catch up with them. Uh, but if it was stable position where there's very flexible enemy uh, contact by we had to go out where they're fighting and hopefully when they're when they stop shooting for a while you know or it got dark or uh, for some reason they'd move then we'd go in there and pick them up but sometimes we had to go out there while they're fighting and we had to crawl and get to them and uh, you, know, you can't stop the war you know uh, just to bring the uh, bring out the wounded because uh, of course you know, when we're moving forward we have to take care of the enemy too as our own as well as our own troops so the medics uh, especially litter bearers they had to go forward to pick up the wounded they had to bring them back to the aid station then they had to go forward and catch up with them again see? they might be three or four miles ahead by that time <laughs> so we had to have a lot of help you know to evacuate the wounded especially when we could not use our liturgy. Now, of course, in Vietnam, we got the helicopter. Yeah? And in uh, Korea, we started the helicopter evacuation, so that saved a lot of hauling. But uh, World War II, all that hauling through the woods, you know, was you know, by, your, by your own muscles. And in the mountains, we had to have at least uh, four, six litter bearers to haul one patient out, you know, over the hills and valleys and across the rivers and... So it took more manpower than it realized. Yeah. Let me hold that thought for a second. I'm going to switch tape.